Andrew Lieb, let's get you in here, managing partner of Lieb at Law. You practice constitutional law because this has implications on 2024, which I'm trying to figure out. Can you tease this apart? When is a falsehood criminal and when is it allowed? Because on January 6, Jack Smith points out that Mr. Trump said Georgia had 10,300 dead people voting. He knew that wasn't true and he said it anyways. But is it illegal to lie? Politicians lie all the time. <laughs> Chance, you're hitting the kitchen room table. Everyone's asking this question right now. Don't we have freedom of speech? What about the First Amendment? And I think you opened up this package explaining how Jack Smith had it, hit it head on. And we have Supreme Court precedent. It's clear precedent that says, yeah, you could say things, but you can't incite violence. And I like to think about it as yelling fire in a crowded theater. Like that's a way to remember it. You can't incite violence. But all of this isn't about lying. And I really have to point that out. There are pages dedicated to showing that Donald Trump knew it was false. But when you walk through this indictment, Chance, there's four different steps of what's really happening here. First, what happens is that Trump goes to these seven states through his six conspirators. We've figured out who five are yet. If you could figure out the last one, we'll be very impressed. But at the end of the day, he goes to these states and he tries to delegitimize what's going on, show why they're wrong, try and get them to change what they're doing. Then what he does is he goes, listen, we're going to set up our own electors, these fake electors. And with the co-conspirators, they come out and they say, we're going to have these people vote instead. And then when that doesn't work, they go to the VP and they say, Pence, this is what you have to do. And when that doesn't work, they fourth, they use the violence of January 6th and they try and leverage that violence. And still up until 11 something at night, they're going to Pence, these co-conspirators trying to change the outcome of the election. So overall, this isn't a freedom of speech case. This is four counts facing 55 years in jail, mostly about conspiracy to defraud the U.S., conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, conspiracy against rights, and again, that obstruction of a official proceeding. That's what we're talking about, Chance. Yeah, let's go to Avajoy Burnett here. Six unnamed co-conspirators were also listed. Um, I know that you are uh, one of our legal experts here, which is why I love throwing these questions at you. But I'm curious to know, is it likely that they will also be indicted? Are these people cooperating? Because didn't some of them give testimony? Correct, like, correct. Did Rudy Giuliani speak to them? Yeah, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, you, you let us know. How exactly does, does this work? Is there a chance that they will be indicted as it's well? It's all... <laughs> It's all of the above. Uh, these are all potentials here. There's a possibility that uh, these co-conspirators who have not been named, they could flip on the former president. They could be cooperating with the government right now. And then we could also see a situation like we did last week in the classified documents case out of Florida, where there is a third person who's been named. And speaking with officials about that third person who was named in that superseding indictment, Carlos de Oliveira, there's a possibility that the Department of Justice was working working with him and then he decided to not flip on the former president. He kind of rolled the dice and said, I'm just going to stay over here. And so that's something for us to look out for. If we see something else down the road where there are updates to this indictment, we got to watch out for who those people are and see how um, their stories align with this particular indictment. Remember um, that there were some things that were unsealed from the previous indictment and all of a sudden they were no longer blacked out. They weren't redacted. And so even though we are thinking we know who these people are, there's a possibility that once uh, we continue to move forward in this, if they either stay with the former president or flip on him, that's when we could get additional details in a superseding indictment, if that in fact happens this time around. Charles, let's get back to you. You and I have been talking for years about your state because as I can read it right now, it seems like Georgia, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin are going to be key. And yours is so interesting because it's its major swing state, Democratic AG, governor and secretary of state. Then you have Republican Senate, Republican House Assembly. Could this conflict happen again there? Are there any safeguards in place? Uh, 
I think people are going to be looking at, you're already here, Republicans on the ground here, talking about the 2024 election around ballot security and bank your ballot, uh, more on the early voting process. But I think we're going to see legal challenges to things like the drop box. Uh, but what I'm waiting to see is how all of this unfolds. We've got the presidential debate coming here on August 23rd. How much of this and all of the legal challenges facing the former president, uh, how will that play out in this first very prominent high profile debate on whether or not even he will be here in Milwaukee for that debate on August 23rd. But I think when you look at the polling here inside Wisconsin, it's still a very close race, uh, uh, at least in the Marquette polling uh, on what's going to happen in Wisconsin. But how will people digest this information? I'll go back to one more thing in the indictment, because the president, the former president, often talks about, you know, the, the fake news or what is being said, what to believe. And even in this indictment, the president, the former president, talks about that there had been more votes than voters in Wisconsin, yet his own team told him that that claim was false. And yet on January 6th, he still talked about tens of thousands of unlawful votes in Wisconsin. So I wonder when people actually look at this document, will they change what they see as the perception of how he's being treated in the court of law with all these indictments? Yeah, we want to thank Charles Benson, Avajori Burnett. We appreciate your time and your expertise. Hopefully we'll get a chance to speak with you again Andrew shortly. Um, we have heard Jack Smith's name in the headlines as the investigation to former President Trump progressed. You may not have heard of him before, but we're sure you've heard the name now. But we still don't know so much about him. Alex Miller, you're still with us. You've done some research. What have you found? You know, Jack Smith has been relatively unknown to the American people. But as I started digging, it's clear that he has a very long career in some very important rooms. And all of that boiled down to getting him this job. And it's a job that nine months ago, guys, he probably didn't think he'd have. A former prosecutor known for his work investigating international war crimes leveled a second indictment against former President Donald Trump, this time regarding Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. I am tonight announcing my candidacy for President of the United States. Shortly after that announcement in November, Attorney General Merrick Garland appointed special counsel Jack Smith to oversee two investigations involving Trump, one of which has already resulted in an indictment leveling 40 charges against Trump after federal investigators discovered classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. Smith got his start as a prosecutor in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office after graduating from Harvard Law School. Throughout his career, the 54-year-old has overseen the prosecution of a range of crimes, including public corruption, gang violence, financial fraud, and violent crime. In 2008, Smith left the Justice Department to serve as a prosecutor at the International Criminal Court in the Netherlands before returning to the DOJ to oversee the Public Integrity Section, which prosecutes public corruption cases nationwide. Wide. Smith later became a first assistant U.S. attorney for the Middle District of Tennessee and in 2017 served a brief stint as acting U.S. attorney under the Trump administration. He briefly took a role as a head litigator at one of the largest health care providers in the U.S. before returning to the ICC as chief prosecutor investigating war crimes committed during the Kosovo War. Garland says Smith resigned from the International Criminal Court to take on this role as special counsel in the Trump investigations. Republicans have decried Smith's appointment as politically motivated. They go after anybody who's running against the president, it seems as though. And if you go up in the polls, you're more likely to get indicted. Smith has kept a low profile since his appointment last November and hasn't given any interviews. But after handing down the Mar-a-Lago indictment in June, Smith said the rules of the law apply to everyone, including former presidents. Applying those laws, collecting facts, that's what determines the outcome of an investigation. Nothing more and nothing less. And you can see that this is something, you know, through his comments today uh, that the rule of law is incredibly important to him and making sure that it is upheld. He specifically, again, talked about uh, the officials, the law enforcement officials that were at the Capitol that day and how they protected not only the building, but also democracy and the principles that we hold so dearly. And he, you know, really emphasized that he believes that the victims here are the American people. 
Yeah, he's a person who keeps things close to the vest. Um, you know, they uh, came out and said, we may hear from him for two minutes. Right. Spoke for about a minute and 30. Which um, can be an asset. Sure. Uh, but, yeah, it kind of reminds me of when they're choosing Supreme Court justices. There's one avenue of we know exactly their history, and there's another, which is that the shorter their record, the better. And he seems to be of that second one of, mm -hmm. you know, just, like, get this clean slate. Yeah, you know, people can just take him for what he is. That's it. Uh, Alex Miller, live from Atlanta. Many thanks. We appreciate you. Now, we're joined by former New Jersey Governor Christine Whitman. Who's been outspoken in her fight for democracy and, in particular, her fight against election deniers. Governor Whitman, thank you for being here tonight. I know we have a bit of a delay, but a good portion of Americans have just simply lost trust in our political and in some cases, legal system. A lot of Democrats see corruption in every single thing Donald Trump does. Republicans see weaponization in the Biden administration. What effect does this indictment have? Well, for the people who uh, are ardent Trump supporters, they're not gonna believe it. And they're gonna continue to say that this is all uh, a plot. And they're not gonna be willing to stand up and say this man's a traitor. He has betrayed his oath of office. He betrayed the Constitution. He betrayed the people of America and the country. But for those, then, there are many of them, uh, Republicans included, who are on the fence, who have been on the fence, who aren't sure. They like some things that Donald Trump has done. They're not convinced of the others, and they're not happy with someone who's had so many indictments. And this may be, in fact, the thing that, that finally pushes them over the edge to say, we cannot let this kind of a person back in the Oval Office. Yeah. Governor Whitman, you've been in the arena for decades. One of the things that Chance and I were talking about a bit earlier is the ability to put some perspective and some context yeah. to something like this. Things that mattered don't anymore. What matters in American politics at this point? Well, I still think what matters is our way of life, our constitution, our democracy, and that people have to understand that this is critical. This is important. What's happened is we've had lots of scandals, unfortunately, throughout the years with our presidents. Uh, we've seen this, seen scandals before, but we've never, ever seen anything like this, where a former president, or at that point he was still the president, tries to overturn the will of the people. And there were some 67 lawsuits that, that were brought by both the former president, ex-president, and his supporters, and they were all denied. Uh, and they were denied by judges who were some appointed by him, some appointed by Democrats. I mean, there just is no there there. And I think that's probably the worst legacy to me from this, from that previous administration, from the Trump administration is this undermining of the public confidence in our institutions. Because when people mm. lose faith in the government, when they lose faith in the rule of law, we're in a very dark place. And we've got to catch ourselves and say, no, wait a minute, there are a lot of good people out there, there are a lot of good public servants, and they are trying to work hard. But it's now time for all of them who have been behind closed doors quietly saying, we don't agree with any of this, we don't like this, uh, we don't think this man should be president, to say it publicly. They cannot keep hiding behind the fact that they have an R after their name or a D. Governor, let's not both sides this here, because I hear what you're saying about, you know, uh, Democrats feel this way and more Republicans need to acknowledge it. You know, in previous years, during Trump years, we did see the Russiagate, the collusion stuff, many of those accusations fell apart in the end. And so, you know, uh, these suspicions and insistence that things are happening because you disagree with somebody, it seems like that's building in a lot of ways, that distrust that we were talking about. New York Times, Siena College just did this poll. It came out today, I think. And uh, Mr. Trump and President Biden are tied for 2024. Trump has a higher approval rating by one point than President Biden. And I know you're with Forward, I believe. At least you were a few months ago when I was talking to Andrew Yang, this third party option, trying to say there are right. other ideas out there. The majority of Americans want another option. But do you really believe that's viable, um, that that could really happen? And also, what are you offering that other major parties are not? <laughs> well, Actually, I believe it's absolutely viable, and we're seeing it every day at Ford with a number of people who, when they understand what we are and what we're offering, are flocking to us. 
I mean, what we're saying is, look, our system is broken. It is not working for the public. These two major parties have such a lock on their candidates and their office holders that they're telling them what to say. They're telling them how to think and not representing. They are then not representing their constituents. What we're talking about at Forward, we're starting at the very grassroots level because people understand that the, your library commission, your school board, your mayor, your council, your local legislators, they're the ones who are making the everyday decisions that most immediately impact your life. When we start to open that process by what we support at Forward, which is ranked choice voting, meaning it's an instant runoff, you get to vote for everybody running for a particular office, but you put it down your order of choice. You know, I like this one first, but if he doesn't get it or she doesn't get it, then I'll go for this one. And what happens is you get candidates who have to talk to everybody, which is a good thing. They can't just talk to their base. And you don't get the nasty campaigns because they want to be liked by everyone. So they're at least everyone's mm. second choice. Because what happens if no one gets 50.1% of the vote, the bottom person gets knocked off. Their number two choices, the people who voted for them's choices for second place, get allocated up the ballot. And you keep going until you have somebody that has 50.1% of the support of the public, which is unusual these days. And so our point mm -hmm. here is you start with the grassroots, you build there. It's going to take time. It's going to take effort. But it's handing back power to the people. So your vote will matter, even if you are a Republican living in a hard Democratic district or vice versa. When you open the primaries, when you have open primaries, when you have ranked choice voting, your vote matters. And that's how we have to start. That's how we have to start to get it back, to get the American people to understand they do have the power to control this. Hmm. Yeah. Former New Jersey Governor Christine Whitman, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. We're going to take a very quick break. Our special live coverage continues right after this.